What's going on my boys, YT Dan back at it again with another video. And today we're gonna be getting in there talking about Joshua Smith's video um, that he made about how should a one card combo um, actually work. And I watched that whole video, I thought it was a great video, but one of the things that I thought that could have been lost in translation um, although I understood what I thought he was getting at and anyone can correct me in the comment section below, but I definitely felt like he was trying to get at a couple key points that I wanted to highlight in this video and we can just talk about it in length and then we can even, you know, chop it up in the comment section, you know, and maybe Konami is here to make some changes, but primarily, uh, his argument was, um, Snake Eye Ash uh, was like a turning point in the game in terms of one card combos. You know, he felt like they do too much. Like basically you could summon that card and he knows that not only are they gonna go off with the one card combo, they're gonna go off in a variety of different ways that are gonna be pretty um, uh, hard to uh, dismantle. Um, and honestly, I would uh, definitely agree with what he's saying there. That makes a lot of sense because obviously, um, you know, Snake Eye Ash does have a lot of power because it can get you into the extra deck and do a lot of different things. But rather than getting into the weeds about like some of the technical cards and and some of those things, and I feel like a lot of really pro players do that a lot, like they get into the technicals. And 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 a lot of us duelists love to talk about the technicals. We're we're just like um, car guys who like to talk about cars. So anytime we talk about um, Yu-Gi-Oh content or Yu-Gi-Oh cards, you know, we, we love to talk about the cards and there's nothing wrong about talking about the cards, but I felt like there's a deeper narrative that he was trying to get at. And I wanted to just kind of highlight that and just shout it out. So the reason why I want to do that, and I got a couple notes here. So this is what I'm looking down at if you're wondering. So basically, um, Snake Eye Ash in particular, the reason why I agree with what he's saying about why um, Snake Eye Ash is way too powerful is basically because Snake Eye Ash allows not only the one card combo to be set up, there's multiple ways to go into Ash. Obviously, you see in Master Duel, it's restricted to one, it's so powerful and easy to get to. However, the, the real reason Snake Eye Ash is so annoying and so strong is because we have been depowered. We've our negates have been taken away in an effort to make the game more interesting and in flow. Um, Konami had an idea of trying to make the game more interesting and in flow. So they created all these different effects rather than just negating, they just do something to interact with your opponent. So, you know, a banish, uh, you know, a, a bounce, a, a push, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and um, that being said, with Snake Eye Ash, there's two things that make it worse than any other one card combo in the game. Um, it has floaters when it goes into that level eight dragon, you know, that's that's a big problem. And then it also has um, graveyard summoning and destruction effects. As you're playing on Master Duel, we're talking about Promethean Princess and uh, I think it's called Amblo Will and or whatever other little shenanigans or tricks they might have. Um, because that deck doesn't have any locks or real restrictions until you start getting into the like Promethean Princess and things like that, it's easily splashable into other things. So a highly capable player can do very elaborate things. But the key issue is the floating and the graveyard issue. Um, prior to floating in graveyards, you dealt with cards, you know, Joshua even brought it up, Alistair the Invoker. That's an OG one card combo, but that OG one card combo was very easy to not only read, but very easy to understand. Like when I first came back to Yu-Gi-Oh, that's what that what that was the most popular combo, I would say. Um, and I took me a minute to grasp it, but when I finally understood it, oh, they summon the Alistair, they grab their spell, they fuse into whatever they fuse into, and then they're always going to be able to pump it by 1,000 attack and defense points. You know, that's good, right? But it's not broken like Snake Eye Ash, because in order to stop Alistair the Invoker, all you needed was Ash, and it was a one-for-one -one trade, and that was fair. But with something like the snake eye engine, you can easily just get two of those guys together and go off. But um, 
the whole deck is set up to put two of those guys together. So, <laughs> and because, um, like we talk about in my other videos about hypergeometric distribution, you can afford to play like 22 hand traps or something crazy like that because all you ever need is just one card. So, since you need one card, technically going first, you have four cards available that need to be put to purpose and then going second you got your one card and then now you got five cards that are available that needed to be put to purpose or that should have been utilized um you know to stop your opponent previously whatever the, whatever the case may be so basically we're just talking about resource management here and what i believe josh was, josh was trying to get at was snake eye ash and the floaters on the field and the graveyard shenanigans is way too much one card combo should pick a lane if you're a one card combo that does snake eye stuff fine special summon from the hand special summon uh from the deck you know put all your monsters on the field but at the end of the turn your hands gotta be like reduced to zero but you can have your six monsters or whatever that's fine so i can dark ruler no more and move on with my life you know things need to be fair like that because I should be able to play as a go second player and technically have a means of, of outing that board with without playing four cards. Like I should be able to maybe play two cards or three cards. Like for example, you know, if you got um, a field and if you have a board set up off your one card combo and I didn't play anything to stop you, for example, and let's say you got six monsters off of that somehow, you know, and none of those cards say negate. You know what I'm saying? So that means you got four cards in your hand that should be able to be put to purpose. So what are those four cards? They should be Imperm, Effect Veiler, Ash, whatever. They should be hand traps, you know, because you're running a one-card combo deck. So And basically, this is where these champions are kind of what I was getting at in my previous video when I was talking about Jesse Cotton and him utilizing, you know, pretty much these distribution ratios to make sure that he could get into certain cards because basically... In a scenario like Jesse Cotton, in a one card in a, in a in the right hands, a one card combo is insane. And combine that with something like triple tactics tactics. I mean, triple tactics talents. That's just way too much. Because if you think about it, like from the perspective of floaters and graveyard effects, and you're going second, right? And let's say I'm like I don't know. I play that Molcharmi card. That's basically like a max C. And then all of a sudden, you're like Triple Tactics Talents, and you look at my hand, and you see Dark Ruler no more. You take it. It's gone. So now I have no out. Like, I tried to use my hand trap and tried to play Dark Ruler no more. From a resource value position, I'm playing a blowout hand trap, and I'm playing a blowout spell card that should be enough to stop a turn or, or to get the board nullified so I can begin my turn or whatever the case may be. But... Basically, resource management, you want to get maximum value off of like whatever those two cards are. But a card like Talents would disrupt that. So, you know, on top of a card like Talents disrupting it and then getting the hand, let's say I do a miracle draw and I draw exactly what I need. I didn't draw exactly what I need if they got stuff in the graveyard that's like, you know, that I can't reach. They got stuff in in the hand that I can't reach. So, you know, so that's why it feels like something like Snake Eye Ash does too much because Snake Eye Ash combined with hand traps, combined with um graveyard effects, combined with floaters is just way too much. But that's why, you know, my recommendation here, you know, cuz I have some solutions you know obviously but you know that's why you know before i talk about the solution i did stop it at this particular point for a purpose because um super uh super heavy samurai uh prodigy basically you know they spoke on this card i think this card the reason why it got like banned and handled so quickly is because primarily it just does way too much and it goes into the pendulum zone so that's like what i'm talking about before about how these other cards like do weird things in weird spaces and you know and i didn't even touch on how you know the snake eye stuff pushes things into the spell trap zone so so not only does it have weird mechanics 
Not only does it float, not only does it exist in the graveyard and on the field and in the hand at all times doing things and in my turn, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just such an egregious thing and it just feels like it's random and doesn't pick a lane. People talked about tier lament in such a high regard and they felt that, oh, you know, well, tier lament is going to be, it was such a, a high skill deck. We love it. We love it. We love it. You know, but to be very fair, what they really love in tier lament is just RNG and they like having maximum resources in the graveyard and they like playing with the resources in the graveyard. Like, like that's the, that's the only thing that tier limit really brought to the table. And it, and it, and it was basically like a maximum, like, like turn, like you go, you go first, you go second and, and duels normally end on like the third turn. Like they always do. They're decided on the third turn or the second turn, like they always are. But these third and second turns are just really, 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 really long. And the Yu-Gi-Oh nerds love that, but the Yu-Gi-Oh players don't like that. <laughs> I like I want to spend 10 minutes to duel, but I want to actually duel. I don't want to wait for you to do what you want to do. And then my turn starts and then you take 10 minutes doing what you want to do just for me to hit surrender, I guess. Or just for me to kind of start my play. And for example, like like while we're talking about tier Lament, you know, you got, you know, they have uh, the cards that float for example when they're destroyed for no reason like i i really like that's one thing that i don't like i don't like how the tillerman cards float like i didn't i don't like how they have that effect like oh we're, we have a negate on us but if you kill us we come right back like that's stupid but again that's one of those do too much things so again it's like tier limit you in the graveyard that's great pick a lane but you in the graveyard and you stick and float on the field you fuse with the opponent's stuff sometimes and your stuff and you can manipulate my grave and you can play snow and all that other stuff if i don't play anything that can affect the grave i'm screwed and in the tcg they can only play one call by the grave so you really not hitting a grave, honestly. So, you know, unless you're playing shifter and everybody wants to play in the graveyard. So it's almost like a gentleman's agreement that we don't play shifter. But when the one dude comes through playing shifter with the tenpai, he's the enemy. He's the asshole. I'm just saying. <laughs> so anyway, um, <laughs> I got a little off track. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the solutions, you know, basically one car combos need to pick a lane one car combos need not to do so much you know one car combos need to make sure that if i'm gonna like for example zombies was a great thing like like the zombie archetype back in the day how um you would summon the one zombie guy and you got the field the zombie field up in the graveyard every all, everybody on the field is zombie and basically it sets a stage of it sets a it sets a it sets a game state but it's set in a unique game state and the card has a negate but it has a situational negate so it's a so it's an air quote fair card you know what i'm saying you know when you get stuff like that set up it feels earned when you complete your snake eye ash full combo <laughs> after you went a uh, second and you hand trapped me to death and i couldn't do anything and then after I couldn't do anything and I'm down to one card pass, you just normal summon snake eye ash. <laughs> <That's> the, <laughs> if you watch my last video, you know what I'm saying. You be <laughs> So basically one card combos need to pick a lane and they need to um, not transgress through that. And if they do do something, at least maybe limit it to maybe one other thing like don't do two things don't float and graveyard float or graveyard something like that you know and and you gotta fix snake eye by you know you gotta take snake eye out in the back and you know what i'm saying like that's the only thing you can do at this point and my second recommendation is to play going second and use blowout cards for maximum value because the one disadvantage of every single 
um, deck that doesn't have a negate, they can all be evenly matched. So if your deck is good at using evenly matched, that's the number one key factor, and setting up a board in main phase two, if you can do those two things, and I know Joshua knows those decks. I don't know all the decks, but you know I play Gladiator Beast, which does exactly that. But I'm saying like if your deck can do those two things, you're in a huge advantage. Like those guys get in, like when you play against Snake Eye and they have no negate and you're like evenly and they got to put it all face down, most of the time they can't recover from that. Like, because not only is their, in, and I'm talking about Master Duel here, not only is their engine kind of restricted and their extra deck is kind of tight, so they kind of only play one copy of things, when things get banished face down, they ain't coming back. And they don't have access to it. And and because of that factor, if you can set up, I don't know, maybe two interactions after that, you're good. <laughs> two interactions in a hand trap, you should be straight. They're not going to recover from that. And especially in a Master Duel for format, that's cake. But, you know, I do recognize, you know, Josh was talking about TCG format. However, these TCG uh terrors are always going to be master duels problem because every time something is so broken in the tcg or the ocg they got to get rid of it they're gonna dump it in the master duel and we're gonna have to fight it so uh you know that's that's just you know my thoughts on that you know i wanted to just talk about that you know he's a great player and i thought that this was an interesting topic that a lot of people um should just get some more clarification on or maybe even konami can maybe even understand or maybe i'm just fucking wrong you know maybe i just don't know what the hell i'm talking about maybe josh was like nah that's not what i meant at all <laughs> but who knows my boy but uh catch me in the next video and as always keep it dank